And the more certain the incoming revenue stream, the higher multiple of value you're going to get. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And today I'm talking to the fantastic Herb Callan. And we are discussing selling your architecture practice. So that might either be to an outside entity or more commonly to people who are already inside of your business who you've carefully selected for partnership. So Herb is one of the US's leading experts in the management of architecture and engineering firms. He has 30 plus years of hands-on experience in the A&E industry. He has held top management positions in a number of high profile firms prior to founding his own company, AEC Management Solutions LLC. He held a senior executive position at Robert A.M. Stern Architects, uh, as well as Aaron Kranst Extut and Kuhn Architects, Burns and Row Engineering, and a CPA firm specializing in the A&E industry. Herb has also served these organizations in a variety of executive roles, including Chief Operating Officer and Chief Financial Officer. Throughout his 30 plus year career, he has recognized that design professionals create an extraordinary value for their clients. To a large extent, the extraordinary value these design professionals create is not rewarded with fair economic return. So Herb founded AEC Management Solutions in 2000 with the simple goal of helping A&E firms of all sizes earn and keep the money they deserve. To achieve this goal, he conducts numerous webinars and throughout North America on ownership, transition, valuation, strategic planning, incentive compensation, project management, and financial management. He helps firms to develop and implement strategic plans, incentive compensation programs, and project management systems that dramatically improve profitability. He also counsels firms on valuation and ownership transition issues to facilitate a smooth transition to the next generation of owners. Herb is an accomplished speaker. He's spoken to hundreds of A&E professionals. He does this each year um, at webinars, seminars, and professional association events. He's been featured for the American Institute of Architects, the NSPE, the ACEC Texas, SMPS, and the ASHRAE, and numerous state and regional events. Herb has a BSBA from Thomas Edison State University and is a certified public accountant. So in this episode, we will be discussing ownership transition and succession planning, how to identify the right partners, what are the qualities that we expect to see in those partners, and we discuss about understanding where the real value of an architectural firm actually lies. So if you want to learn more about Herb or work with Herb, please make sure you visit his website at www.aecmanagementsolutions.com. And right now, sit back, relax, and enjoy the fabulous Herb Cannon. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Herb, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? Well, it's great. It's great to be here. Really, you know, I want to thank you uh, for inviting me to be part of this uh, part of this podcast. I'm honored by it. Thank you. My absolute pleasure. Now, yes, so you've had a really fascinating career. You're a, you're a CPA by training. Um, yes. And you worked at Stern, Robert Stern, for many years and helped them build their practice and kind of grow from a handful of partners to, what, what was it, 18 partners or so? Yeah, they, you know, when, I, when I first met them, you know, Bob had just become the Dean of Architecture at Yale University and actually hired as a consultant with a, with a six-month assignment three days a week. Um, ultimately, it turned into uh, 13 years, uh, two, three days a week. And I helped them grow from 150 partners to th- 150 employees, rather, to uh, 350 uh, employees, eight partners to 16 partners. And, um, you know, really helping them really dramatically explode their profitability. 
Brilliant. Um, and since then, you're now working as a, a consultant and you specialize working with um, a in, you know, architecture design firms um, in the in the space, helping them with things like we're going to talk about today, such as succession and valuations of, the, of a yeah, practice. Yeah, you know, I've had my own consulting practice since the year year 2000. And, um, you know, my 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 emphasis has changed during the years. I think when we, when I first started my practice, um, incentive compensation was a big, big area. Um, also did work with, um, valuations and transitions. Um, and over the years, certainly over the last six, seven years, it's been probably 80% in the area of valuation, ownership trans internal ownership transition, occasionally help firms to identify an, an outside acquirer. Okay, great. Fantastic. So let's let's talk a little bit about ownership transition because it's something that many architect practices it's probably one of the most important decisions that a practice will go through in its in its life. And what we tend to see here is that it hasn't always been thought about and it can happen in a quite reactive manner. Um and there's a whole world of interesting dilemmas that arise as a result of having not considered this this event. So uh, what's, a, what's a good place to begin here? What, 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 how would you describe what is ownership transition in the first place? Well, you know, owner, ownership transition, the key word here is transition, right? Mm -hmm. It's not an event. It's a, it's a sequence of events over, over a period of time. I think is probably the best way to think about it. You know, there's the, there's the financial issues. How much is my firm worth? Um, how much could I get selling it to the outside versus transitioning to the employees inside? Do the employees have the money to buy it? How can I make it financially attractive? Um, and then, then there's the, the actual transition is how are they going to take over the day to day management roles that, that are really necessary for them to succeed and for the departing owners to extract their value on the way out. You know, I, I try to facilitate, even though the owners hire me, I try to facilitate something where both sides, everybody wins, mm -hmm. right? Either everybody wins or everybody loses. That's, that's generally, generally the way these, way these things work. Um, if we, if we set the price too high or the terms too onerous, you know, the first bump in the road, the deal would tend to fall apart. And, you know, the owners don't get their money and you've ruined the financial future of the people buying in. So nobody wins. So yeah. we, we try to structure the financial part of it where, you know, it's not a it's not a straight path. We're not always going to be at this level of profitability. Some years will be here and be some years. Yeah, you know, not that great. So there needs to be a mechanism in there that to to defer or or to defer payments or deal or somehow deal with those unanticipated events. Hmm. Now, what's interesting in, in architecture is typically we'll see partners or new leadership rising through the ranks in an architecture business. And then we'll see some form of deferred compensation if they want to become equity holders in the company. And there might be some well there should be some sort of valuation of the of the business and then the future profits of the business are then kind of used to um to for, for that transition to to happen but we see lots of interesting things for example um you know many young partners might not necessarily understand or know why a company has been valued the way it is and then it's not until a few years down the line when they're looking at what they're their kind of agreement is that they've signed up for and they understand the mechanics of the business better that they start to perhaps question well how did what what how did this valuation happen so how do how do we value an architecture practice and particularly if one has got a charismatic leader for example where they're the ones that are bringing in the work and all their relationships are the ones that are responsible for it yeah well when, when I talk about ownership transition, we talk about the founder the, uh, of, of the firm, there's really three qualities or, or three skill sets rather that they bring to the firm. You know, one is they have, they have their architecture license. They, you know, they're a good designer, mediocre designer, good enough to pass their test, right? They have their license. Yeah. 
Number two, just by virtue of being in business for a number of years, they've picked up some business skills along the way. No, but the third leg of the stool and the most important one and the most difficult one to replace is that marketing skills. It's the ability to bring in new clients with new projects. And, you know, so when, when, the, when the sole owner is thinking about transitioning internally, they think about how are we going to fill these three skill sets? Mm-hmm. You, can, you can find other people that are licensed and, you know, they can do, they can produce work seal the drawings um people can I, I always say well if someone can manage a project profitably you can learn to manage a business i actually think managing a project profitably is more difficult than managing a business profitably so um and, and, but the big thing is is really that marketing skills and you know a lot of times what i'll hear from the project managers or other team. Well, you know, Herb, the way the way that I market is I get repeat work from my clients. I, I do a good job. That's the baseline. Okay. Yeah. That's the expectation for everybody who's somewhat senior in the firm or project manager. Get repeat work. It's a different skill set to identify and bring in new clients with new projects. And that's where that that's one of the one of the big challenges is where it comes in. And it doesn't happen overnight. Mm-hmm. Um, it takes a period of time and some people won't do it until their backs are up against the wall, right? Where they're facing the financial crisis and say, Hey, I met, I better figure out how I'm going to get new work from new clients here. Yep. Well, it's, it's interesting. Most founders have gone through that experience when they first set up the business where if they don't win work, then how are they going to keep the lights on and how are they going to pay the rent and all that kind of stuff. And that's how right. those skills are often b- uh, born. There's, there's no question about it. You know, when, when, they, when they start out, when I do my, 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 my seminars, webinars now since COVID, you know, I talk about, the, you know, there's four different quadrants that we look at people, people in. And one is the practice centered practice where, hey, I'm going to open up my practice. I'm going to do great work, do the best possible design work. I'm going to give the, give the best client service. You know, word's going to get, I'm not going to worry about the business side. People will realize what a great job that I do. <laughs> the business side will take care of itself. Well, the world should be such a perfect place, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work out that way. You know, generally what, ha- what happens in 999 times out of a thousand, there's some sort of financial crisis. You're having trouble covering payroll. You're out to lunch with the client. Your credit card gets declined. Maybe your cell phone gets turned off. You say, wow, you know, maybe I better get a business person in here, an accountant or some sort of business ad- advice so people recognize my design genius, okay? And yeah. Yeah. So there becomes some recognition that business is part of the longer term strategy. Yeah, so it's really when people's backs are up against the wall that they're forced to do those things to stay in business and become more successful. Got it, got it. And and so how does uh, how do you begin then to start to evaluate the firm's value? If, if we've got if we've got somebody who's kind of their main responsibility is to bring in the work and if they disappear then what's what are we left with well well yeah yeah exactly and, and that's the challenge you know we can only value the business at a point in time right you know right now you know we're in uh, in March of 2023 and I'm valuing businesses what was your value on December 31st 2022. 2020, 2020. I'm an accountant and I'm working in different years. It's, I forget what year it is sometimes. Um, and so that's what it was at that point in time with that person in charge, with their personality driven firm, perhaps. Um, and there's always, you know, there's always something in there that says, you know, the assumption is that the, the company will remain the same. Mm hmm for pretty, pretty much with the same employees. Should a key person leave, it's, it's dependent largely on the size of the firm. You know, if you're a, a, an eight or nine or 10 person firm, and it's the person whose name's on the door, who is the face of the firm and brings in all the business is no longer available through death or disability or retirement or whatever, you know, the firm's in jeopardy. There's no question about it unless yeah. there's been some sort of transition of those responsibilities and, and, 
and awareness in the marketplace to other people. Um, you know, if you're a 150 person firm and you lose that person, there's already some other people in the organization that have some level of, of client loyalty and, and, and rec you know, recognition outside of internally in their firm. So th there'd be some retrenchment. Maybe the 150 person firm becomes a 110 person firm and, you know, they rebuild it and, and they move forward. So a lot of it's dependent on the size of the firm. Got it. And, and I guess um, when we're looking at, say, a transition, an internal transition, there is a form of earnout, I suppose, from the own from the owner. And yeah. it kind of, you know, once the once there's a deferred compensation plan in place and the younger partners are buying the business, then you've got a clock ticking, I suppose, to for them to start learning all of those those um, those skill sets that the, uh, that yeah. the previous um, founder has or had developed. Yeah. You know, the one thing that I think that we need to recognize when there's going to be a transition and someone's buying the firm, either internally or externally, there's only one source of income to buy the firm and that's future earnings. Right. Now, if we're selling to the outside, you know, so you're going to get a larger down payment because they have the cash to do it. Your employees really don't, in most cases, don't have that cash. You sell, mm -hmm. you get a higher down payment, but that company's assuming that within a period of three to five years, they're going to recoup their, not only that investment, but be able to make the, the future payments and eventually it's, it's theirs. When we transition it internally, you know, a method that I've, I've been successful with um, for quite a few years now, virtually all of my clients use it, is that we're going to allocate some percentage of the employee who's purchasing future profits towards paying, paying off the note. So let's say, and I'll give you an example. Example: of This sometimes is difficult to explain verbally without yeah. a diagram, but I'll give it. A, I'll give it a shot. Let's say we have a firm that's uh, that's valued at, at a, I'll use U.S. dollars, right? A million, yeah. a, mil, a, mil, a million, a million dollars, um, and I'm going to buy ten percent of the firm, a hundred thousand dollars. In many cases, there would be some discount off of that hundred thousand for ten percent. Maybe they're going to sell it to me for eighty thousand mm -hmm. dollars because of you know number one, I don't have a controlling interest in the firm. I'm only buying ten percent. They're rewarding me for some loyalty of past performance. We sell at eighty thousand dollars. Now, the way it would be financed is I would give them a down payment. For round numbers, let's say I'm going to give them a check for $10,000. We're left with $70,000 that I owe them. I sign a promissory note for that. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I tell them is, since I'm entitled to 10% of the profits, I'm going to allocate 50, 60% of those allocated profits every year towards paying that note. With the residual, assuming it gets distributed, I have money left to pay taxes put a few more dollars in my pocket. So in yeah. good years, profits go up. I accelerate the payments. If we have a COVID-19 situation and there's no profits or little profits, the payments just get extended and the deal doesn't fall apart. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the basic strategy that I use on an internal, internal financing. And I can tell you the vast, vast, vast majority of of internal transitions that I do use some variation of that. That that's the baseline. There's always a little bit of twist so so, so so we typically working then that the valuation itself gets fixed, and then the way that it gets paid off is through future earnings. Or do we see valuations that fluctuate? Uh, you know, if you've got a, a, a transition that's taking ten years, do yeah, we see yeah, that, if that, I'm that buy, if, if I'm going to buy ten percent for ten a year for ten years. Right. Okay. Right. Going going forward, yeah, we could either fix the valuation. You know, ten years is is a, is a long time. Uh -huh. uh, what I would generally recommend is that we don't revalue it every year, but maybe every every third year. Okay. You know, re revalue it because um, we need to think about the the practicality of some things also. Mm -hmm. If 
I, if I, as the purchaser, know the firm is going to be revalued every year, I'm really almost working against myself. <laughs> <laughs> to improve, right? Yeah, to improve the do a bad job, you get a better deal. <laughs> yeah, it's like I'm improved. I doubled the firm's profits. I doubled my cost to buy in. <laughs> so, yeah. So we don't want to. So we want to. We want to kind of get everybody moving in that same direction. So we need to somehow deal with deal with that issue. Yeah. So so well, it might so it might make sense then a kind of a having a time frame over the, a, and a percentage of future revenue. Um, actually might work and it, as in it incentivizes everybody. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. We can, we can work out something, something like that. And, you know, and you know, one, one thing I know it's a little bit, you, you didn't ask this question, but I need, I need to, I need, I want to make sure we address it is that, um, you know, the employees, you know, owners make, make a big mistake sometimes in thinking that they're going to lay some deal on the table and, I'm going to, well, don't you sign. I'm going to sign first. You know, the employees are going to trip over each other to get this, uh, get it signed. It doesn't work that way in most cases. And you don't want it to work that way, right? Because then they, you know, clearly have no idea what they're getting into. Um, and sometimes you can put the best deal in the world on the table and they just don't understand it, that they're getting a great deal. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's a little bit, it's a little bit of a sales job. To show that you know, I try to position it in a, in a way and explain it to the people buying in that hey, you're getting a good deal and this is how it's going to be paid. And the only mm-hmm. thing you're really at risk for if you use my financing scenario is that initial down payment, that initial ten thousand dollar check that I wrote because everything is from future profits. So we need to present it in a way to them that's reasonable, that makes sense, and we need to stay away from a lot of the financial jargon that gets into it. I, you know, we need to communicate in a way that is understandable by both the seller and, 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 and the buyer. You know, mm-hmm. we need to, we need to, I remember, you know, when, when they, they see some of these numbers, they might be overwhelmed, might be overwhelmed by it. You know, the firm is worth $2 million. Oh my God. You know, you know, here in the U S a dollar sign, they got two commas after it. You know, <laughs> the, these people are lucky the day before payday. If they have one comma, in their checking yeah. account. So, you know, the numbers, you know, can be a little bit for those people who don't deal with numbers all the time. Um, it could be a bit overwhelming. So we need to slow things down and just really develop, a, develop a comfort level on them because you want them to be comfortable. Well, it's, it's a different um, profession as well with architects, as opposed to say lawyers, for example, who are probably a little bit more accustomed to taking out a bank loan and investing into their, you know, investing into the business, and oh, yeah. you know, and and buying in. It's very rare that we see architects have the capacity uh, to be able to do that, or the will to want to do it. But we do see, um, you know, these kinds of deferred compensation plans happening, where in effectively that the 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 younger partners or the next generation, they're not necessarily putting anything into the business themselves. It's kind of all it's kind of future earnings. Mm-hmm. And there might be a bit of sweat equity that's led to them um, getting more ownership, but there's that they, 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 they don't always have the same level of skin in the game, if you like. Do you think that's uh, that's something that we need to be cautious around? Yeah, I got the, I, I really think there's a real mental connection between someone taking their pen and writing out a physical check for in, in the ideal world. I don't want a wire transfer. I don't want a laser printed check. I want people to take out that pen and write down the name of the company or the person and and the amount of money. Because that that's when it gets real. Yeah. You know, and if we talk about the, a deferred compensation, when we talk about dirt deferred compensation as a way to fund the transaction, is what we're really saying is people are being under you I'm underpaying you now. Mm-hmm. In the hopes that you, and you got to hope that you're still here ten years from now, and I'm still willing to sell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So that's that's the way I, that's the way I personally look at deferred compensation. It, it, yeah, and and I guess it becomes a little bit of an abstract thing, if you like, and you know, it's not uncommon that we'll see 
um, partners who have signed up for a deferred compensation and then they might be asking the question well why am I why am I doing this why don't I just take the profits you know what's the what's the benefit to me being a partner rather than just being a highly paid employee and this is this is a question that when then there's then there's been a bit of an issue with the selection process in the first place yeah you know, you know that brings up a good point you know the, you know those of us who are owners of firms we can't understand you know you can't understand why, why wouldn't everybody want to be an owner? Mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot of people who are just really risk adverse. You know, they tell me, you know, I get owners, they say, Ma, you know, Herb, this person's been with me for 22 years. You know, they, they, they interned for me in college and they worked in the plan room and they worked their way up. And, you know, I feel like I owe it, I owe it to them. I said, well, so what you're telling me is over the last 22 years, not only have they not gone out and started their own firm, they haven't even taken another job. <laughs> they, they, might, <laughs> they might be a little bit risk adverse, okay, to something like this. And uh, you know, and some people, you know, and, and here, here, in, here in the states, you know, we have what, what I call some of the states are lifestyle states. Mm-hmm. Colorado, right? Those people, they're done at five o'clock on the weekends. They are mountain biking. They are skiing. They're hiking. They're hunting. They're fishing. They're leading a healthy lifestyle. They don't work on Saturday or Sunday. Are you kidding me? It's, it's, out, it's, you know, it's out of the question. So they don't really have that, that mindset of doing whatever it takes on the work side to achieve, to achieve something. It's more of a lifestyle. And yeah. there's other, other, I'm sure there's, places all around the world like that. New York City, on the other hand. It's a business. When I was consulting for many years at Robert Stern Architects, they had a a model shop where they would build huge physical models. Most people wouldn't wouldn't believe, just huge physical models. And, you know, it was on Friday afternoon. They say, listen, Bob wants to see a model of this by Monday morning. You go go in on Saturday and Sunday during the summer, and there'd be 30 people in the office working so you know two two a.m in the morning on a, on a friday people in the model shop building models so that's a, a completely different mindset regionally yeah yeah and, and and so so what advice do you give then to an owner who is looking you know you know at, first of all what point in their career should they be thinking about transition when is a, when is a good time to start these conversations when is too late and how should they be identifying um, the people to, to buy it? I think it depends. Uh, as far as the, the timeline goes, is when should they think about it? Um, if their goal is to work until age 75, that's one thing. Yeah. If, it, if they, if, if they want to retire at 62 or 60, that's another thing. Yeah, I, I think... You know, ideally, I think it should probably be 10 years in advance mm-hmm. of whatever your ideal retirement. And you know what I'm saying? You get somebody involved with 10, 5, 10% of the company. That's all. Start, start, start them on that path. See if they like being owners. See if you're comfortable being partners with them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the big, big challenges that partners or sole owners of firms have, am I going to have to share my financial information with them? Uh, yeah. Yeah, they own, they own part of the firm. Doesn't mean you have to share everything every day with them, but, you, you know, you, and you want them to learn. Mm-hmm. You want them to learn and be comfortable. Well, they're going to see how much money I'm making. Yes, they will. So this is, so this is out, of people's, out of people's comfort zone, and this is why they tend to kick it down the road. Mm. And there's also things like well, now they got a partner, you got to consult with them on certain things, or or, the, or they or they're they're certainly going to think that they they have input into every decision, yeah. and that's really not really not the truth. But they're you know some people are temper you know it's going to be well you know listen um, I don't like the coffee we have in our coffee room, or maybe in the UK it's what sort of tea you have in your tea, you have in your tea room. Um, or you know, you know, we, we you know we only have this many holidays. I'm thinking about maybe we should add maybe maybe another, another some more paid time off for people. Or you know, 
think, you know, you know, a lot of firms here have summer hours, you know, where, so on Fridays, they only work half a day and they make up for it somehow. And other, we should think next thing, you know, now, now I have a partner. Oh my God. Now, <laughs> where I didn't have to deal with, deal with all of that before at, at, at a partner level. So th this kind of puts people off. Well, the, well this kind of kind of goes back to the kind of maturity of a business doesn't it in in terms of having you know a sole owner who might be you know that they're the ones calling the shots they can do whatever they want and then yeah. it seems like a good idea to introduce other owners and now you've got a democracy and things yeah. need to be decided together as a group it's becoming more democratic anyway you know? when i own 90 percent, it's not that much of a dumb <laughs> it's the, i give people i would give people the perception of having some input <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, so, 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 but, how... but, 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 there, but there's a positive here that I always emphasize to owners too. You know, as we become, as we we get older, we get more, we get more conservative fiscally. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll become you become more risk adverse when you get when you get older, uh, and then maybe not seizing on all of those opportunities. So when you bring in a partner, you know that you know probably younger than you. Hopefully, you're bringing in someone that still wants to accomplish something on their own. So they would help me and me as someone at my age to expand my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so we kind of we kind of look for those. It's not all negative. There, there's a lot of positives that come into having a partner. And, and do you recommend that it's always somebody within the firm, or sometimes you can employ find someone out externally to come in and be become a partner? Um, yeah, most time, yeah, <laughs> you, you're best off looking internally, but if, right. if we look at those three legs of the stool that I've talked about, the marketing, mm -hmm. the business, then the, uh, project, project delivery, generally, if they bring somebody in, it's on the marketing side, right? you know, because they can't, they haven't identified that person internally and you need to be cautious there. I think they come in, they come in as a, as an employee with some financial incentives and if they in goals and if they meet those goals, then there would be a, a partnership opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. Now, what about if an owner decides that they want to sell it to an outside entity? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is this quite a common thing in architecture? Do we see this happening quite a lot? I imagine you, you might get more commercial kind of business orientated architecture practices, gobbling up smaller ones for, for entry into new sectors perhaps, or to, or as a talent grab. Yeah, both 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 of those things. Yeah, somebody who wants to get into a desirable market sector, you know, maybe they've had a, yeah, they've done a little bit of healthcare or something like. But there's a firm that does a lot of health. Well, that would be an you know an attractive market sector for people for people to enter for people to enter, um, and that's certainly um, a, 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 mo a motivation. Um, yeah, we, we, we do see that. I'm seeing more and more of those opportunities come to me personally. Right. You know, I primarily work in the area of internal ownership transition and have mm -hmm. not really actively sought any, you know, represented being a broker, if you will, to find right. a, um, an outside. But they're coming to me and I am taking advantage of it. And I'm about to um, working on one right now that hopefully will is supposed to close. It's... Um, it's a very narrow market sector there. It's an architecture that specializes in animal health care. Right. Okay. Okay. So it's like veterinary offices and, and, and like doggy daycares and, and, and yeah. things like that. And it's interesting, you know, the more, almost more, the more you specialize in a, in a market sector, the more you, more attractive you become. You know, as as an act, if, you know, I've done a fire station. I did a couple schools. I've done some houses. I've done. You're taking anything that walks in through the door. You're not recognized as a market. There's a, there's a lot of people like that, and it's like, well, what makes you special? Why would anybody want to buy you? Yeah. Um, so, sort of thing. Not, no, no, I don't mean to be harsh. I mean, that's that's a great business if you want to do it, but you're looking at an internal transition in 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 those in those cases. Um, do, do we see other industries, you know, engineering firms eating up architecture firms or purchasing architecture firms or contractors perhaps mm -hmm. buying architecture firms or not so much? Well, well we, we, we could see civil engineering firms um, acquiring landscape architecture firms. Right. 
is, is something uh, generally, um, you know, God, let me see. You know, if you're if you're a, a big, uh, large engineering, small architecture sort of firm, yeah, you could you could see them acquiring architecture firms. You know, I also work in the engineering. You know, I work with architects and engineers, and engineers tend to be more uh, more about growth, mm -hmm. being more about bus on the business side than on than on primarily on the practice side. So uh, particularly with civil engineers, you need to have a lot of locations because you need to be local in order, yeah. in order to get the work. Um, so I've seen, I've seen a 200 person firm with 10 offices. Right. Wow. Okay. So that's a lot, a lot to wrap your head around, but you know, there's always, there's always acquisitions. And you said one was like a, a, a talent grab. Yeah. You know, it's very, very difficult to certainly here in the U S to find talent. Um, it's been difficult for years to find to hire enough enough people for the for the volume of work. So mm -hmm. you know, if you're a, a forty person firm and you could acquire a twelve person firm that has five licensed architects and three drafters, you know, it's it's easier to do that than to hire a headhunter and. Uh, <laughs> And hire all those people. So yeah, that could that that could be an. Oh, all, all, one, one point I, I did want to bring up. Sometimes, if if an architecture firm wants to sell to the outside, one of the things they can do to make themselves more attractive is to expand the number of owners that they have. So if I'm the sole of the sole, I'm the sole owner of the firm, and I got an 18, 20 person firm. They know I'm selling, so I'm, so I can leave right after a period of time. Well, who, right. who is there after me once I leave? Well, if I bring in you know a, a, a couple of three owners that own a smaller percentage each, it shows that they have some ownership experience. And once I leave, there's other you know senior management that continues. So I've done a number of those where it's it's a, you know we let, let's do this first get internal, broaden the internal ownership, then we'll present ourselves to the outside. And it, it, it's a strategy that works fairly well. So it's kind of future proofing it and you're kind of removing any bottlenecks or, you know, the, the kind of one point of failure, if you like. Exactly. Exactly. It's, hey, you had enough faith in these people. Like if, if I'm the sole sole owner, like, hey man, I got these, these people are terrific. They're going to be terrific at taking over and but well, how come they're not your partners? You know, yeah. is, is the question. So a lot, a lot of things that we do in positioning a firm to be attractive to the outside is try to eliminate some of these big questions that the acquirer might have. So <clears throat> what are the sorts of things that can cause the downfall of any type of acquisition, either externally or internally? Well, ex ex externally is kind of e easier to talk about. It's um, you know, the big thing is is the cultural differences, right? You know, generally it's a larger firm swallowing up a smaller firm, and the larger firm you have more rules, you have more bureaucracy because that's the only way they can manage it, um, and so that becomes some, somewhat of a somewhat of a culture shock. You know, you need you know, the employees when you're acquired by an, by another firm. You know, all your you know, you know well, certainly here in the U.S. I'm not sure we're you know our our healthcare system here is so screwed up um, that you know your healthcare benefits are going to change. The number of days you of, of paid holiday that you have are going to change. Uh, maybe your hours are going to change. Maybe your you know, I could be a, a senior person in, in in my in my firm, and now all of a sudden, you know, where I have direct contact with the owner, now I could have a boss, and 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 my boss could have a boss. You know, so that's clearly that's a that's a you know, and people so people tend to get fed up with that and leave, so they lose yep. a lot of talent. Also, the acquiring firm can make some assumptions that well, you know, listen, we have an accounting department. We have IT people. We have marketing. We can get rid. We can get rid of these. We can get rid of these three people. That's going to go right to our bottom line. But what they don't realize is that 
their overhead people are probably at 110 percent capacity to begin with and they think they're just gonna dump, they just think they're just going to dump these other things on it's like wow look, now <laughs> we saved all this money doesn't work out that way um i guarantee it so it, it, that's there's a lot of ways that the external acquisition right fit goes downhill internally um you know it's People need to learn to sell. You know, all business begins with a sale. If you can bring the business in, you can figure out a way to get it done. Okay. And, you know, people don't really understand that until they're in the position of having to do it. Um, you know, and sometimes there's, conf you know, just because I'm the benevolent dictator of my firm and I'm going to bring in three people, doesn't that mean those three people are all going to agree on each other? They, they may tell me the right thing just so they become partners, but then there could be some internal conflict between the three of them about the direction of the firm. Oh, right. you, people, you guys are just all about the money. You don't care about the design. Yeah, well, you're saying that because all of your projects are losing money. That's why you're going you know, to... You get, you get into those sort of things. So, you know, some people are fiscally responsible, others are not. Is it important um, if, you, if you're bringing on, say, a group of partners, for example, in a transition, that they all have those three skill sets that you talk about, the winning work, the designer, and, and the business, or can you kind of split those skill sets among them as individuals, or does that cause issues? No, I, 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 I think it's, it's, it's the latter of what you said there. You were going to split that. Someone's going to be the primary marketing person, somebody mm -hmm. in charge of project delivery and somebody. Now there's going to be overlap. Sure. And just, and just because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm watching out for the business. Well, watching out for the business might be 40 to 60% of what I do. And mm -hmm. the other 40% is I still want to do my architecture work. Yeah. And just because I'm, I'm the marketing person, that doesn't mean that I don't want to be involved with some of the design of some of the projects I bring in. Some I may not be that interested. Other ones I want to be intimately involved with. So there's mm -hmm. always going to be some over overlap there. I, I guess um, when you see a larger practice like, like Robert Stern, then you can start to have much more of a, a, a blend of skill sets within the partners or? Yeah, well, you know, am amongst the, well, the, when, when you're a large firm like that, then you have you have the managing partner. They just manage the business. Mm -hmm. That's all. I mean, they're not they don't get involved with the, the, the design. Bob Stern is the senior partner. He really doesn't get involved with the business. He oversees the design. And then all the other partners who they, they manage they manage your product. They have I mean they have in certainly varying degrees of input of the marketing for the whole firm. Um, but that, that place is an interesting dynamic. A lot of very smart, very talented people work there. Yeah. And I was really um, I was really honored to help them achieve a lot of their financial goals. And I'll always be I'll always be grateful for that opportunity. Amazing. And um, we see a lot these days and hear a lot about ESOPs and employee owned businesses. Yeah. What, what, what is this? How is how is this differing then from uh, this kind of partnership transition and and what does this mean for the for the sustainability of a business when it now becomes employee owned it seems to be a very so it's, it's both here in, you know i know in the us and here in the uk this is a something that's becoming increasingly popular so we, you have you you have esop plans in the uk yeah okay well i can't speak for how what they are 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 in the uk clearly but here in the in the us an ESOP plan, it's really a retirement plan. Mm -hmm. um, and the employees don't really own anything other than their portion of, 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 the, of that retirement. And the big advantage here is there's a big tax, tax advantage because the profits from the ESOP are not taxed. They nice. go into a tax-free entity that's drawn upon later. So there's, there's a lot of intricacies and in, ins and outs of that. I'm not a big fan of an ESOP plan personally. Um, mm -hmm. They're very, here they're very expensive to set up. They're expensive to maintain. 
And so you need to be a firm of a certain size before you even consider it. I see. I, I'm, I'm always left a little bit confused as to, well, if, as an employee, what is it that you're actually owning? And when you're no longer an employee, well, what do you own? You don't have the ability necessary to sell that your stock back to anybody. Well, well, well in the ESOP plan, yeah, yeah, they're, they're obligated to pay you. They're obligated to pay you here. Um, you know, but if, if we get away from the term of ESOP and just having more owners mm -hmm. in the firm, I'm all, I'm all for that. I'm all yeah. for getting people involved with actually owning something. Um, here, you know, if we have a, a stock company, we could have 100,000 shares of stock and I can get somebody involved with, hey, Herb, you can own 250 shares of stock. Now, what does that work? That's like one quarter of 1% of the company. But it's still, hey, I'm, I'm still a stock owner. Yeah. It sounds better than one quarter of 1% of the, of the company, but I am, and I, I feel like I have more of a part, a part in it. And I, I am more, I am worried about profits on projects. I make sure the lights are turned off when the, if I'm the last one in the mm -hmm. office, I, if someone else is, is goofing off, you know, or, or doing something that's, um, dishonest or questionable, I'm more likely to, um, speak up about it. So yeah. I, I think there's, I think there's a lot of benefit to having, uh, op opening up ownership to a wider group of people. Great. Um, when we're looking at these transitions, who are the other people that you would advise an owner to consult with? Mm -hmm. who, are the other, who are the other players? Well, um, aside from me, um, <laughs> you know, I, you, you, we certainly want to get some, at some point, at some well, point, well, not well, in the beginning, at let's, some let's, point, you want to get your accountant involved, yep. your outside advisor, CPA, accountant, mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps, perhaps your attorney. If we get the attorneys and the CPAs involved too soon, um, they tend to screw up the deal. Right. So what's because, your... I mean, think, you know, think, let me speak about attorneys for a minute. I sure. love, love, love attorneys. I use attorneys. I'm one of my daughters as an attorney. And, but, you know, an attorney represents you. And, you know, they're, they're going to make this deal. The, the, the mistake that they make is on an internal transition. They treat it as if it's an arm's length. Somebody from the outside is buying the firm. Mm -hmm. And so it's brass knuckle negotiations. And, you know, that's not really the relationship in the architecture firm. We want to get something that there's, we don't want the deal to fall apart. I would probably say 20% of the work that I pick up is from work that were crafted by attorneys with all their good intentions. But the minute there's, there's a, that COVID hit or there was a recession or there was something, the whole deal fell apart. Mm -hmm. And we don't want that. We want it to, we want to be able to find a way to have it work, work through it. So um, that's the downside of the attorney getting involved too early. Uh, so we have we have an, uh, the attorney, the accountants, not too soon, not but, too uh, soon. but obviously you'd have your you might have your internal accountants if you're a larger yeah. a yeah. larger firm, and then someone like yourself. How, how would you describe your role as well, a management I'm, consultant or I'm a, a management a, consultant, an advisor, a facilitator? Also, you know, I think you know my, my title is one thing, you know, is one thing. Uh, my function is really something something fluid. You know, is it, at the end of the day, I, 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 rep, I represent the person who's selling. But I, I really try to act as a facilitator so we can work out a deal that's really agreeable to everybody and nobody gets hurt. Right. Is it common then, um, if, if you're acting for the, for the seller, that the buyer might hire their own kind of equivalent management consultant who comes in and they do their valuation of the firm and you've got your valuation of the firm. Is that a scenario that kind of rears its head? I, 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 I've been there, did that, done that. Um, generally, the, 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 the employees don't have the financial ability to go out and hire 
a team a team yeah if 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 you if you will but you know they said they they do have sometimes they have their own advisors mm -hmm. um sometimes when that happens it winds up that the deal doesn't go through and there's a lot of hard feelings as a result mm. because they go you know they can go to their an outside an accountant or outside attorney and they just come up with these things that are just i mean clearly they've never worked with an architecture firm before um you know what one of the big one of the, and just one of the big things on evaluation of a firm of an architecture firm if you go to someone who does not specialize in our industry and you go to a generic valuation firm you're going to wind up with a valuation that's probably unrealistic in most cases because they they use a software and they plug you into a category that includes professional services and that includes accountants attorneys mm -hmm. architects engineers anybody else they consider professional services well the thing about our industry is we do not have a lot of repeat repeat business we don't get all of the clients repeat business even if they're doing a lot of work now what your accountant on the other hand i ask people how many people how long have you had your account your cpa firm Oh, 14 years, 22 years, 18 years. How many times, how many times did they sell that to you? Well, once, maybe they didn't even sell it to you. You called them up and asked them, right? right? So they have a very high, very predictable 90% plus recurring revenue stream coming in every year. Mm -hmm. And so they're, and the more certain the incoming revenue stream, the higher multiple of value you're going to get. Right? It, only, it only makes sense. And that's why all the, a lot of these software companies are going to a subscription model rather than selling because it's, it's every year they're going to get 95% renewals yep. uh, uh, on this. We don't have that. So, you know, people like myself who specialize in our industry realize that and we do valuations that are more realistic. That's very interesting, and we've seen this in the in the past. From you know, one of the reasons why we always recommend yourself for architects to go and be to be working with is because you understand the nuances in an architectural practice and get to a much more realistic valuation of what it's actually you know worth. And as we're discussing all these kinds of nuances of you know where is the work coming from, who has the ability to be able to win the work, this is all baked into. Um, you know the valuation of the company and the future, the future earnings of it. Absolutely, um, I, I think it's um, you know it's it's such a it's such a fascinating topic. This and we see practices get it quite wrong, if you like, um, and you know perhaps it's something that's un you know not considered uh, enough. Um, and so, or as you say, people end up kind of kicking it down the road for a long period of time because they, you know, they don't, they're not ready to let go or whatever. And then it becomes questions about retirement and then they start to, to actually, <clears throat> actually do it, actually get in, get involved. Yeah, they, they do. And it's sometimes, you know, these owners have this mental plan of how it's going to work out. Well, I'll sell it to these two people and blah, blah, blah. Then when they finally broach the subject, these people aren't interested. Mm -hmm. Or the key person that they thought they were going to get get involved with, they, they, they had some good, they were going to be the face of the firm. They, they leave. Well, you should have got them involved with some level of ownership years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of waiting to now. So we have, you know, and, I, and I've, I've seen that happen time and time and time again. That, that's real. And it's... Um, it's unfortunate. So if you have key people and you really want to keep them under your umbrella, there's no better way than to get them involved with some level of ownership. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, and, and I emphasize to these people, yeah, they, you know, you know, Herb's letting you in with 5% of the company, but I guarantee you Herb doesn't want to make 5% less. He wants to make 5% more. Right. So yeah. the idea is, yeah, and I really, you know, I really emphasize this to people. It's not about taking the pie and cutting it up into smaller pieces. We want to grow the pie, right? 
for doing a million dollars of revenue now, we want to do 1.1 million next year, right? Then you'll make more money and Herb will make more money. That's the idea. Yeah, love it. Brilliant. Well, I think that's the perfect place to conclude the conversation there, Herb. That's been a wonderful uh, in-depth look at this at this idea of succession and transition and your wealth of expertise is, is amazing. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed Brilliant. it. And if- and if people want to reach out to you and and speak more about um, transition, if they've got a business, they're coming to that. What's the best way for them to get in contact with you? Oh God, I can give you my email address. Um, Great, HKN. we can we can put we can put it all in the info of the podcast. So, yeah, put 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 it all in in the info. Yeah, you know, um, send an email, give me a call. If you send me an email, I'll probably send you back a link to my online calendar to book a time that we can that we can talk. And I look forward right. to that. I, I, I mean, I really, I really do in, in, in enjoy that. I, I probably do well over thirty valuations a year. Um, I probably, I probably have done. I can't, even, I can't even keep track. This is really the busiest point in my career. I'm sixty eight years old, and I should be doing less work. I'm doing more work than I ever have right now, but. Uh, I do, I do enjoy it and I have no intention of stopping. Amazing. Brilliant. Thank you so okay. much, Herb. Thank you very much. Thanks. Cheers. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.